Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. So if you have your Bibles this morning, uh, I would ask for you to turn to Psalm 67. Psalm 67. Uh, before we go in, I think we have a picture. Uh, it looks like um, it's, a, it's a map of the two islands where we serve. And just to give you a visual image of where we were. And so uh, if anyone doesn't know, Africa is not a country, it is a continent. And so I know we've, we've traveled all over America and it's amazing how many people still think Africa is a country. Uh, but there are many countries, beautiful, wonderful countries in Africa. And uh, so we worked in Tanzania, but off the coast, you can see these two islands. Uh, most people maybe have heard of Zanzibar uh, and they think it's uh, it, it's one island, but it's actually a group of islands, an archipelago, and we served, and actually we met. We're not proponents of missionary dating, but we met on the field, and actually the Lord led us to each other while serving as missionaries. I was there 10 years, Camille was there five, and... Um, Anyways, we met on this island called Pemba. And to get there, you have to take, uh, from the coast of Tanzania, you have to take a ferry two hours to the island of Zanzibar, and then you have to wait till the next available ferry, and you take an eight-hour ferry from Zanzibar to Pemba. That's how most locals travel. Uh, Camille, way more than I, uh, but that's how most people travel on and off of the islands. And so they're literally what we would consider the ends of the earth. Uh, the Lord brought uh, my spouse. Can we get an amen for those who are still waiting on their promise from the Lord? Um, but we love what God is doing. And so this morning, we want to we wanna look at Psalm 67. And this is what is usually or historically considered the missionary psalm. And I know a lot of you might be thinking, well, isn't missions a New Testament principle? Isn't it a concept that we find in the New Testament? Very much so. We see Jesus uh, gave the disciples the great commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. And so we also see in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the early church, he sent them out as a church on mission. We read throughout the New Testament and there, is, uh, there, there are commands, there are stories, there are examples. We even have a vision, a picture in the book of Revelation that one day there will be standing before the throne of God, people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every people group worshiping Jesus for eternity as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I know I just want to address something that I think we sometimes when we read the word nation or we see all of those words, we get confused because today we live in an age and day when you Google nations, you see all the nations of the world represented as geographical locations. So you see like the, the nation we were a part of, Tanzania, uh, you might see Kenya in Africa, you might see uh, all these nations represented around the world. But when the Bible speaks of nations, it actually talks about people groups, people that are separated because of language barriers, geographic barriers, cultural barriers, and even tribal barriers. I'll give you a quick example. Tanzania, where we were, one nation geographically, but there were 120 different tribes in that nation. Those 120 different tribes spoke 120 different dialects. Thankfully, they were united by the language of Swahili, but their mother tongue, the dialect in which they were born and taught, knowing and speaking, there were 120 distinct ones within the country of Tanzania. And so whenever we, we hear, go and make disciples of all the nations, whenever we read throughout the scriptures and we see the peoples and the earth and the ends of the earth, whenever we see that final picture uh, in Revelation of all these, you know, the Bible is very clear sometimes. It didn't leave room, or room out for anybody people of every nation, tribe, no matter your tribal differences, every tongue and every people group will be represented before Jesus. Why? Because he died for them and he loves them. And so I want to make a statement today, this morning with you guys, that missions isn't just a New Testament principle. It is a God principle. It existed in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation because it exists in the very heart of God. 
God loves all people who were created in his image and that they were separated because of the effects of sin and that image that he placed on them has been marred because of sin. And there are beautiful people that Jesus died for in languages all across the world where the Bible is yet to be translated, but they deserve a chance to hear the gospel even one time. And so this morning, as we look at Psalm 67, this psalm is much more than a prayer uttered out of the lips of one of earth's proven saints. It is a prophetic declaration that is what has been held by faith for generations is increasingly becoming sight in the days in which we live. That Yahweh, the ever-loving, everlasting, covenant-keeping God of Israel is being worshipped and adored and enjoyed and proclaimed by Gentiles and heathens across the world. That the nations of the earth, the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and that he will reign forever and ever. Psalm 67 is more than just a beautiful song of worship sung in a chorus by those who have been blessed by God. It was a heavenly mandate for Israel to be God's light unto the nations beyond. And today it is his reminder to us that we would remember that it's going to take the whole church to reach the whole world. As we look at this psalm, may our hearts cry out together, do it again, Lord. Do it here in Dover, Delaware, among the dozens of nations you have sovereignly brought into our backyard as a harvest for your glory. Pastor invited us that as we're here in this town, there's a mosque right down the street. We drove by the mosque this morning and we prayed this very prayer. Lord, do it even there in that location. Do it across our nation amidst an ever-increasing evil agenda to destroy your image and the very people you created in which you sent your son Jesus to die for. Do it in every Muslim nation and among every Muslim tribe throughout every heart language spoken by Muslims across the globe. God, would you be gracious to us and bless us and cause your face to shine upon us so that your eternal way would be known among the 867 unreached people groups that still remain in sub-Saharan Africa so that they might see your saving power. Now let us read together as a prayer, Psalm 67. I believe it's on the, on the slides. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face to shine upon us. That your way may be known on earth, that your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Lord, let the people praise you, O God. Let all of the peoples praise you. That the earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Amen. I'd like to open up this morning with a story of a, someone that Camille and I know uh, in Africa. And his name is... Uh, Yahya, that is his, the Arabic version of his name. And Yahya was born in a small village off the coast of East Africa. He was born to a Muslim family, but he was also born with a disease that in the days when he was around was considered an incurable disease. It's what we know today as leprosy. So he was placed in a modern day leper colony. And because of that, he was isolated from having a lot of friends, from having neighbors, having a social life. In fact, he never even went to uh, uh, what we would call like a, a, a school. He never went to school. He never studied um, um, in a public school system. He didn't have a lot of access to very many people. But there was one person who would constantly come and visit and it was an imam and the imam would be like a pastor within the Islamic faith and he would come and he would share and teach the Quran with Yahya and he would tell him certain things and, and, and just try to encourage him as he, was, as he was growing up and he had little to no hope. And then there was two things as Yahya tells his story that this imam shared with him. He said, never go to church and never trust Christians. 
But Yahya continued to grow up. He became older and he stayed in that village for several years, but he had very little hope. He was desperate for what many of us today would call a blessing. Now let's talk about the word blessing. Do you think it's okay to pursue a a blessing? Many today misunderstand the biblical concept of blessing. There's usually two extremes. Some people either see it as evil, that having nice things uh, is not a good thing, or other people would see it as a uh, sign of God's hand or favor upon your life, a sign of spirituality. Someone who has a lot, they are hashtag blessed. (laughs) Unfortunately, we have a very one-sided perspective. We take a word in which God has given divine meaning and purpose and we reduce it merely down to having a lot of things or personal happiness. And my intent is not to condemn because I'll tell you what, I'm the chiefest of sinners. I use the word blessed probably way too much so you can breathe. (laughs) But what we want to look at is there's a word, there's a meaning behind this word blessing that is so much deeper than just the physical things or the things that we can get or have here on earth. Because what about the single mother who works three jobs to provide for her family? Can she be blessed? How about the young adult who gets in a car accident after attending a church service and loses his rugby scholarship? Can he be blessed? Or what about a family that unexpectedly loses a loved one? Can they still consider themselves to be blessed? And because we often misunderstand this word, we tend to misappropriate it, we misuse it. And Camille and I, we've been traveling, we've been to so many different churches throughout the States, but it's amazing because we get to share about our life in Africa, how sometimes you go to villages and you take what's called a bucket bath. So you literally have a bucket of water and you're splashing water upon yourself and that's how you bathe. Or we've been to villages where there's no electricity for sometimes 18 hours in a day. And when we share these stories of some of our experiences in a limited uh, segment, I've, we lived there 10 years, some people live in, a lot of people live in Africa their entire lives, and yet they're very blessed, and they're very uh, uh, content, and they're very happy and full of joy. But we hear this common phrase as, man, in America, we are so blessed. And think about it, in America, we have constant uh, electricity, praise the Lord, We have running water. Uh, Actually, most people probably have one car, if not two cars. Uh, Maybe not in Delaware. I I should have known my demographics here, but uh, where where I'm from in Western Pennsylvania, you you can't walk places. Uh, You you don't walk to Walmart. You don't walk to those areas. Um, But in Africa, we walk everywhere. Most people don't have a car. And yet a lot of families have one, maybe two. I heard uh, some places around the States, you can work at McDonald's for $15 an hour. We are blessed. In Africa, there's a great pursuit of this idea of blessing as well. And we've seen it firsthand. People will name their children blessing. People will name their hotels blessing. Uh, there's a, I had a, a picture, but it says Al Baraka Hotel. And it's literally the concept, if I name something blessed or the word blessing, God's divine favor will be upon it or we will be able to inherit, inherit his blessing. Some people name their businesses blessed there's, there's a lot of connotations, a lot of ideas wrapped around. But around the world, there's more than just this pursuit of what is uh, considered a blessing. The word itself has a meaning that God has spoken. And so when we look at the first verse of Psalm 67, we notice the psalmist crying out, may God be gracious to us, may he bless us, this is a prayer, and make his face to shine upon us. These are relational words. They're not transactional words. Oh, to God that when we pray, we would be speaking with our heavenly father. Guys, we have access to the father because of what Jesus has done upon the cross. When we are forgiven of our sins, we can come to God and cry out, our spirits literally cry out, Abba, Father. He is our father in heaven. We don't need to do business transactions with him. Yes, as people, what I love about prayer is we are a people in need and we can go to a God who is abundant in his resources. In fact, he's limitless. But we go as a child going to a father. And when our perspective is our God is our father, what one of you parents, if your child had a genuine need, would reject them from that need? 
Now, sometimes as kids, we ask for things we don't need. (laughs) We ask for maybe too much money or too many things. But we have an open relationship to God and we see this demonstrated through the psalmist's prayer. The The words are relational, they're not transactional. And they're increasing in intimacy as he continues to pray. Be gracious to us. God, would you bless us? And then he says, would you make your face shine upon us? It goes from just a general being gracious to maybe blessing for physical things to God, may your very presence be upon us and go with us wherever we go. The Hebrew word for, for blessing is baraka. If you, can you turn to your neighbor and say baraka? Baraka. This is also the root word used in many languages across the world, like Swahili, the language that we speak and the islands where we serve, Uh, also in Arabic, in Somali, in Amharic, and a handful of other languages. Did you know that the first time that blessing is used in the Bible, or bless, when God blesses somebody, it is in Genesis chapter one, the first time is in one, chapter one, verse 22, and it's when God created the birds and he created the beasts in the water, and it says after he created them, he blessed them, and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And then in chapter one, verse 28, he created humans in his image, and he says he blessed them, and then he said to them, be fruitful and multiply. God blessed his people and his creation before they ever even knew they needed things. And yet somehow we've attached to this term blessing that it's all about what we can get and what we need and what God can give us. When blessing biblically is very much a relational word because the first point here is that God's blessing accompanies his presence. When we pray for the blessing of God, we should be praying not just for things, but we should be praying for his very presence to come upon us. Because when we have his presence, when we're in that relationship with him, those physical things, the needs that we have, they will, fl- they will follow. We see examples all throughout the Old Testament of this. Whenever God was with his people, then what they needed, those things were provided for. These are words and phrases demonstrating God's very presence. And the psalmist begins by defining God's blessing in conjunction with this very thing. So what what happens when God's presence comes? In the New Testament, there's another word used. It's called kingdom. You know, many times when Jesus spoke, he said the kingdom is at hand or the kingdom is here. And when Jesus spoke of the kingdom, it was a similar concept. It wasn't just things that would come with the kingdom. It was the very presence and the rule and the reign of God through Jesus coming to earth. Jesus came announcing that the kingdom of God was at hand. He even taught his disciples to pray when they asked him to teach, when they asked him to teach them to pray. He said, pray this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what happens when the kingdom of God comes? Or what happens when the kingdom of God doesn't come? What does it look like when God's presence is not with us? Or what does it look like when God's presence goes with us wherever we go? Heaven's presence, God himself, blesses and affects every aspect of our lives our needs, our homes, our families, our faith. Think of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus defined what it means to be a blessed person. And I'm just gonna paraphrase, but in opposition to pride and personal independence, Jesus said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Against the idea that we should want happiness at every cost, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, those who mourn. Has anyone experienced God's supernatural presence in a time when you were mourning? Think of earlier this year, I lost my mother, 61 years old, unexpectedly. And I'll tell you what, we we took time off, we didn't travel, we didn't speak, we grieved, but the presence of God was so tangible and real to us. The ministry that God ministered to us through people, through his word, through personal times with him, through each other was powerful. And yet when people look at those who mourn, sometimes they consider them weak 
but they consider what do they have to offer. I'll tell you what, I felt so strong under the presence of God in those moments, almost like I wasn't myself because Christ was working in me and in us. Blessed are those who mourn. Not just those who are happy all the time, those who are continuously filled with outward expression. To the powerful, to the high and to the lofty, Jesus said, blessed are the meek. Blessed who are those who would humble themselves and not seek to elevate over other people. When everyone else was pursuing personal needs, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake. Jesus defined what people who are blessed look like and it was his presence changing the narrative of the people that were around. And at the very end of as Jesus is giving these beatitudes, he turns to his disciples and he says, blessed are you when you're persecuted for my name's sake. And I'll tell you, Camille and I, we spent several years in Africa. Imagine, I was there seven years before I saw one person come to faith. Sharing in a place where there was a million people on our island, 99% Muslim, shared the gospel with, with many people. After playing basketball games in our English classrooms uh, and small groups, I was invited to mosques sometimes to teach English and people would ask, what's your name? I'd share my name. They'd say, are you a Muslim? And you get to share an open opportunity into the hearts and minds of Muslims for the first time who Jesus is and how he offers salvation through the cross. Seven years praying, fasting, declaring the goodness of God and through the message of the cross and not one person came to faith. It cost us hours and years of labor. Our teams faithfully prayed. We, we fasted, we learned the local language, we lived among the people, we sowed these seeds and then when the first person came to faith, you heard a little bit from Camille, but he lost everything. He was kicked out of his home, his family was, was divided, he lost his job, all because of his decision to follow Christ. And what we learned is he took Jesus' words. He wasn't seeking personal blessings. He could have been asking, God, bless, my, bless me with a new job. God, bless me with a means to get out of here. But he said, God, I want the blessing of your presence. And he said, Jesus, you are worthy if I have to suffer and endure these things so that your church would be established and planted and advanced on the island where we serve. If it's for your sake that more disciples would be made and more people would hear the gospel, let it be. And he took Jesus' words literally when Jesus turned to his disciples and said, blessed are you when you're persecuted for my name's sake. And he said, I, he didn't fit, literally say this, but he felt like the most blessed person because he had the presence of God. Someone who once didn't know God now knew him. Someone who was once an orphan now became a son of the living God. Someone who had once lived in utter darkness. Guys, we know this is our story, but it's not just for us to hold to ourselves. Blessed, the idea of blessing is, is connected because God's blessing accompanies his presence. Secondly, God's blessing accomplishes his purpose. Has God blessed us merely for our own enjoyment or is there more? Is there a greater purpose? In the Bible, God's intent with Israel was that they would be a light unto the nations. Isaiah 42, six and seven says, I am the Lord, I've called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light to the nations to open the eyes of the blind and to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. As God called Israel, he blessed them so that they would be made a light unto the nations. And it's the same thing when we are blessed through our relationship with Christ, he calls us to be the salt and the light of this earth. We are blessed not just to enjoy his presence while we should, and while we should delight and dwell in him, we are called to steward his blessing, to steward the light he gave, and for us to shine as a light to the ends of the earth. And anytime when you read scripture, when Israel uh, rebelled against this mandate God had given, they were in trouble. <laughs> That's when he sent the prophets. That's when he called them to repent. That's when things got worse. But when Israel upheld their, their mandate to live as a light unto the nations, it revealed God's heart and his destiny for us. And it's that God's blessing 
accomplishes his purpose and that's that his light, his news, his gospel would go to the ends of the earth. It's his idea to bless us and God very much so wants to bless his people. If you look back at Psalm 67, you see the psalmist is praying a prayer that we should pray because we want God's presence on our lives. May God be gracious, may God bless us, may God make his face to shine upon us. Why? Not just for us, but so that his way would be known on the earth and that is saving power to all nations. The bottom line is this, if there's nothing else you write down this entire message, make sure you walk away with this one point. He blesses us that we might be a blessing to the nations. Not to build empires here on earth, not to accumulate things that will eventually no longer be, not to gain recognition and become well-known or just to pass away one day and be forgotten, but to be a blessing and to be a blessing to the nations. His purpose is that all nations would know him. And you might be saying, well, I'm not rich and I, don't ha- I, don't work- I work two jobs. I don't live in a large house. I'm not the wisest. I'm definitely not the wisest person on this earth. But if we as followers of Christ who are redeemed children of God, we are truly blessed. We have everything we need for this life and to serve God because of what he has given us through Christ. Missions is essentially an invasion, an invasion that we are invading the nations with the presence and the message of the hope that we have through Jesus Christ. May our prayer this morning be like the psalmist, that Lord, you would bless us so that we might be a blessing to the nations. Do you remember the story that we opened up with? This young man who was born in a Muslim family off the east coast of Africa, born with a a disease considered uh, or called leprosy, separated from his family, separated, didn't have childhood friends, never studied a day in public education. And he had this imam who would come to him, teach him from the Quran. Do you remember the two things that he was told never to do? Never go to church and never trust a Christian. So Yahya eventually becomes 17 years old and life is just going. He's really reached a point where he feels like there's no hope left on earth. And someone visits his village that had never visited before. And this guy comes and he says something actually very bold. He says, I know somebody who can heal you of your leprosy. But all you have to do is you have to come with me to church. (laughs) Can you imagine? The only place he knew he was told not to go, this guy's saying, there's an offer, there's hope that you have that someone can heal you but you have to come with me to church. So Yahya in a very desperate place leaves, follows this man, goes to church for the very first time ever in his life, meets the pastor, they go down and they introduce Yahya to Jesus. They say, there's a man who came 2000 years ago. He died upon a cross for the sins of those who would believe in him. He came to bring not just everlasting life, but to bring heaven literally here to earth. That's the kingdom coming. People who were demonically oppressed could be set free. Those who were sick could find healing. All of these things could happen because of what Jesus had done. And they prayed for Yahya there at the front of the church. And they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And after they were finished, Yahya walked out of that church. He wasn't healed. He actually went back home and he hated Christians more than he did before. And he said, now, if, there's ever, if there was ever a reason not to go to church, I definitely have one and I'll never go again. One week went by and Yahya woke up one morning and 90% of the scars on his body from leprosy were gone. And he had no explanation other than, I met someone who told me that if I went to church and met this man Jesus and accepted him and prayed and believed that I could be healed. Then he thought, he was so excited. Because I mean, if you wake up and 90% of your leprosy is gone, uh, he was so excited, he went to his family and he began to tell them, you would think they would be also excited. Well, they weren't. In fact, they rejected him and they said, you're no longer welcome to our family because of his decision to follow Christ. So now with no home, no family, he finds his new family in the family of God. Thank God for the church. He becomes a member of that church. 
actually the church becomes his home. Because in Africa, it's a little different. I don't know if Pastor Ryan, uh, if you can do this here, but they, they have a lot of benches. And because the pastor didn't have a house or a room for him to stay in, the church became his home. So he became the security guard for the church and he lived in the church. He slept on the pews, he, he went around back and did the bucket baths, all of that. Well, what happened is for two to three years, he was discipled in that church. And Yahya, he, remember, he never went to school. So he never learned how to read or to write. And so God himself taught Yahya how to read and how to write. He got his first Bible, went to the streets, starts sharing with people John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And he says, turn to John 3.16 and read it. And they'd turn it and they'd read the wrong verse. Because he heard his pastor preach so many times, he knew, he said, that's not it. Find John 3.16. And through this, he, that's how he learned to read and write. Then he gets discipled. He gets, and he feels at the end of this, God's called him to go to Bible college. He wants to start a church. And he says, I'm gonna to go to Bible college. He applies and they, they call him back because in the application, they ask, what's your level of education? And he said, zero. <laughs> that was the only option he could put. And they called him and they said, listen, you know, this is a, a accredited place and you, know, you have to have a, at least a, a, an equivalent of a high school diploma in order to go. And he said, well, I can't have that because I've literally never studied because I was born with leprosy and Jesus healed me and I never had an opportunity to go to school. And so he, he asked them, he said, by faith, if you let me come and if I do not fail any of my classes my first semester, let me come another semester. And they said, okay. And so he went, not only did he pass all of his classes, but he was one of the highest marks in the entire school. <laughs> then he meets his wife and they begin to plant a church and the church grows and, and, and they see this, all this fruit. And as they're praying, as they're praying, because they're, they've, they've seen God do so much in their family, he could literally retire there. But because as followers of Christ, we're obedient to him, whatever he says to us. If he asks us to go across the globe, we go across the globe. And he, he's, as they were praying, the Lord spoke and said, go to an island called Pemba. Can you bring the map back on the screen? So he leaves his home country off the east coast of Africa. And for the first time, like going to another country, he goes to this island called Pemba, which is where Camille and I met. And he arrives there with his family and they served there for 30 years. He planted a church. His church has been burned down three times. He tried to move into a house one time. They said it for 30 days. They, they said the 10 years, no one lived in the house because it was demon possessed. Literally, the side road became a, almost like a jungle with just grass all up because no one walked on the path anymore because they said demon spirits ruled that area. And he said, well, praise God because greater is he that is in me than he who's in the world. <laughs> Pastor Yahya, then he goes into that house with his family. They pray and fast for 30 days. And he said, by 30 days, people were walking on that side path like it was a main road because the presence of God had invaded he then plants a church. So this church, after three times being burned down, he's given a property on the military compound. So he has safety and he has a church. And when he's seeing that he's, he's pastoring Tanzanians, but he hasn't really had an opportunity to break into the Muslim area, he's asking God, you sent me here, not just to reach my own people, but to reach the people of this island. It took him 25 years before a door opened and he was invited to go to a local prison goes to the local prison, and now to this day, he has a church of 250 people who were former Muslims, most of them were former Muslims, in the prison systems. He says he shows up, they have their own choir, their own deacons, their own everything in the, in the prison. He shows up and he preaches and he prays and he blesses the people. And some of those guys have been released and they're going back as Christ followers back to their families for the first time. God's blessing accompanies his presence. God's blessing accomplishes his purpose, which is going to the ends of the earth. But lastly, and this is where we're gonna end, if, if um, Aria could come up to the keyboard, God's blessing anticipates our participation. And when you read Psalm 67, you see uh, the psalmist praying a prayer, God bless us. Well, that word us 
involves some level of participation. God has a role and we have a role. And I wanna challenge you this morning that all of us in this room, myself included, we have recommitted ourselves over and over again. God, if you were to call us from where we are to go to Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia or any country, we feel led to give our lives because not many people are signing up to go to the Muslim speaking places, the Muslim nations of this world where people are still unreached so that we can share our faith in the gospel, which gave us hope and changed our lives. We would do it again if God spoke this morning and said, go somewhere else. So I wanna, I wanna challenge you as we pray, God bless us. Let's know that God's blessing is always going to accomplish his purpose, but we are a vessel and there's a level of participation on our, that we are called to as well. And just like Pastor Yahya, who could have retired in the church he planted on, that, on the mainland of Africa, could have retired and everything could have been well. But when the Lord spoke, he was over 35, maybe close to 40 years old, the Lord spoke, said, take your family and go to an island called Pemba. He laid it all down. He said, yes, King Jesus. So I would make a plea with you guys this morning. I'm not going to, you can put, move your eyes away and say, okay, uh-oh, the, the, the missionary is gonna call us to the field. I would just challenge you with this. Anytime we worship together in a sanctuary like this, I love that this is a multinational uh, church. Praise the Lord. But 40, catch this, 42% of our world is still unreached. They've never heard the gospel. They don't have access to a church. They don't have access to a missionary. They don't have access to Bibles and, and, and gospel literature and material. Some of them, a large percentage of that 42%, have never even met a born-again believer or a spirit-filled believer one day in their entire lives. 42% of our world Jesus died for that 42%. He shed his blood. And when we come together in this sanctuary and we take communion together at different times, I'm always reminded that there are people that Jesus died for that belong to the family of God that are not here yet. And it's gonna take the whole church to reach the whole world. So I would ask you one minute, I know we don't have a ton of time, but one minute, would you close your eyes and would you genuinely ask the Lord, King Jesus, God, bless me. God, be gracious to me. God, may your face shine upon me so that the ends of the earth, all the nations, all the people, all the tongues would know who you are. And then ask him, what do you want me to do about it? What is my role in seeing the whole gospel reach the whole earth? King Jesus, we just ask as you speak to our hearts, give us the strength to be obedient. As you blessed the first people you created and you said be fruitful and multiply, you gave them the strength to obey your command. And so Lord, we ask this morning, give us the strength to be faithful and to obey so that one day we can see in heaven a great multitude of all the nations, tribes, and languages there will be people from Pemba, people from Zanzibar, people from Saudi, all the tribes in Tanzania represented because not only did we say yes to faith to you, but we obeyed when you called us to go and make disciples of all the nations and to pray for the laborers who would go. We love you, King Jesus. For the glory of your name and your honor around the world, we pray, amen.